I'd like to welcome you to the uh, UFM Lou Douglas Lecture this evening. Uh, I'm Linda Teener. I'm the Executive Director at UFM Community Learning Center. Uh, just as a little background, UFM is over 41 years old now. It was started by a group of K-State students and faculty as a way to discuss issues and to share and learn from each other in a setting outside the traditional university walls. We invite the community to share their ideas and their skills and to learn from each other. We coordinate over 300 non-credit courses and about 70 credit courses each semester. That's open to the K-State and Manhattan communities. And last year, we served over 29,000 people in the variety of programs that UFM provides to the community. Our lecture is named for Professor Lou Douglas, who was a distinguished professor of political science at K-State from 1949 to 1977. Uh, Lou was widely known for his power to inspire students, faculty, and citizens to instigate change and to motivate grassroots organizations and individuals to pursue social justice in politics, economics, and foreign policy. Tonight, following our lecture, we will have a question and answer period. Uh, please feel free to come up to the microphones to ask your question because that way everyone can hear and our speaker is uh, very excited to get your questions uh, so that uh, you can have a dialogue about issues of Kansas energy. If you need to leave uh, following the lecture, please do so quietly so that others can hear the question and answer session as it goes on. Tonight's lecture was um, influenced by discussions that have been happening in the state of Kansas around energy policy. How we produce energy in the state, its costs, uh, feasibility of using alternatives, the environmental impact that it may have uh, are all things that have been discussed uh, widely in the last few years. In case you aren't aware of it, UFM has an array of 15 photovoltaic cells and have a demonstration project in the use of solar energy. And on a regular basis, we uh, compare how we're, how we're doing in terms of the energy that we're generating from the sun as opposed to what we're using directly from Westar. We also have a passive solar facility that has both classroom space and a greenhouse. And we welcome anyone to come over and uh, take a look at it. We'd be happy to give you a tour and talk to you about what we've learned about passive and active solar energy in the last few years. Our speaker tonight is Nancy Jackson. She's the executive director of the Climate and Energy Project. She holds a master's degree in environmental history from the University of Kansas and has uh, been involved in editing scholarly books on American culture and the development of Western resources for the University Press at KU uh, for 10 years now. She sits on the Midwest Greenhouse Gas Accord Advisory Group, the Kansas Energy and Environmental Policy Advisory Group, and the Kansas Wind Working Group. All hard things to say. Thank you very much for that. The Climate and Energy Project is a program of the Land Institute, which is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization founded over 30 years ago in Salina. Land, Land Institute scientists are working to develop perennial versions of the world's major crops, and the Climate and Energy Program promotes the rapid and cost-effective deployment of energy efficiency and renewable energy to reduce greenhouse glass, gra gas emissions increase energy security, and build a, a better energy policy for the state of Kansas and in the Midwest. So I'd like to have you meet uh, Nancy Jackson, who'll be our guest tonight. That's just one of the reasons why you don't want to say greenhouse gases very often. It's easy to, easy to butcher. Um, Good evening. It is a great pleasure to be with you and, and an honor to be part of the Lou Douglas Lecture Series. Thank you very much to UFM for the invitation. Um, I will tell you before we start that this is absolutely the biggest PowerPoint I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> so if it begins to jump out at you in the aisles, um, I apologize for that. The pictures didn't look nearly this big uh, before. Okay, so this series, the Lou Douglas Lecture Series, has been jolting conventional wisdom for 25 years. 
We'll see if we can't do a little bit of that tonight. We do, after all, live in a moment full of a bit of gloom and doom. Our global economy has suffered a severe shock, and many remain out of work. Congress faces gridlock on many issues, with energy about to be in the spotlight again. And it seems that at every turn, we hear that our choices are mostly bad, or at least that they're mutually exclusive. We're told that we have to make a lot of either or choices. We can have abundant energy or a healthy environment, good jobs or clean air. Given these choices, naturally, many of us will opt for energy and jobs, leaving the environment to be fixed by someone else at some other time. But I submit to you tonight, we are being asked to make a false choice. We don't have to make either or choices today. We can have abundant energy and a healthy environment, good jobs and clean air. In fact, the global economy of this century, your century, Kansas has the resources to thrive. We have the fuels for the 21st century and we have the values to drive us there. What is that? <laughs> We don't know. Okay, I'm sure it'll stop in a moment. In the early years of the 21st century, I see the Great Plains rising. So what's the context? Today we witness the convergence of two very important challenges, climate and energy. The good news is we can address both together and in the process, we can lead a technology revolution, become again a dominant manufacturing superpower, and make our, make our nation more secure. I wanna talk for a moment about this picture. I'm sure that many of you know, uh, I, I put the, the globe in a little greenhouse um, just to, to illustrate that challenge. But you may know a little bit less about the energy side of the challenge. So I wanna address that for just a moment. A lot of the either-or choices that we're facing today have to do with a fallacy that most of us have adopted, and that is this, that anything that we do next, whether it's wind, whether it's nuclear, whether it's solar, whatever it may be, is going to be expensive. That part's true. However, it would be untrue to assume that renewable energy is going to be more expensive than the other choices that we make. It could be, but here's what we need to know for sure. The average age of a coal plant in the United States of America is 44 years old. That's in a 50 year life. So clearly, no matter what we do, we are going to be building as a nation a tremendous amount of new generation. At the same time, our transmission system is up against the limits of reliability. That means the lights are gonna flicker, the lights are gonna go out, unless we rebuild our electric grid. So we're going to be making investments over the next 15 years of hundreds of billions of dollars, which used to sound like a lot before the era funds got spent, um, but hundreds of billions of dollars, and the result of that is our rates are going up. Our rates are going up. So what we need to decide now is, what are the impacts that we choose from our new expensive electricity. There are a number of unusual partners in the conversation to come. First, you have here a list of tremendously distinguished generals and admirals from the United States Armed Forces. In two recent reports, an impressive group of military advisors concluded that, quote, Global climate change poses a serious threat to America's national security. For them, this is about risk. General Sullivan, we never have 100% certainty. If you wait until you have 100% certainty, something bad is going to happen on the battlefield. 
That's something we know. Admiral Lopez, you have very real changes in natural systems that are most likely to happen in regions of the world that are already fertile ground for extremism. General Kern, the critical factors for economic and security stability in the 21st century are energy, water, and the environment. When these factors are not in balance, people live in poverty, suffer high death rates, or move toward armed conflict. The generals and admirals recommended full integration of climate risk into national security and national defense strategies. And in September, the CIA opened the Center on Climate Change and National Security. Hardly the usual harbingers of an environmental issue. Going almost 180 degrees to the faith community. Here is a list of faith organizations that have made very firm statements on this issue. From the General Board of Church and Society of the United Methodist Church, the scientific consensus is clear that human activities are leading to a warming of the surface temperatures of the planet, and the effects of this warming are being felt now and will be felt more intensely in years to come. As a matter of stewardship and justice, Christians must take action now to reduce global warming pollution and stand in solidarity with our brothers and sisters around the world whose land, livelihood, and lives are threatened by the global climate crisis. The US Conference of Catholic Bishops. At its core, global climate change is not about economic theory or political platforms, nor about partisan advantage or interest group politics. It is about the future of God's creation and the one human family. It is about protecting both the human environment and the natural environment. It is about our human stewardship of God's creation and our responsibility to those who come after us. The Evangelical Climate Initiative. The same love for God and neighbor that compels us to preach salvation through Jesus Christ, protect the unborn, preserve the family and the sanctity of marriage, and take the whole gospel to a hurting world also compels us to recognize that human-induced climate change is a serious Christian issue requiring action now. And moving on to science. We hear a great deal about disagreement in the scientific community. And of course, dissent exists. In fact, it is critical for the scientific method to have a healthy interchange between thesis and antithesis. It's necessary for progress. However, in a letter to Congress this October, these organizations said this, observations throughout the world make it clear that climate change is occurring and rigorous scientific research demonstrates that greenhouse gases emitted by human activities are the primary driver. These conclusions are based on multiple independent lines of evidence and contrary assertions are inconsistent with an objective assessment of the vast body of peer-reviewed science. Moreover, there is strong evidence that ongoing climate change will have broad impacts on society, including the global economy and on the environment. For the United States, climate change impacts include and they go on to a long list. The National Academy of Sciences, the United Nations, and 130 other countries have essentially said the same. This is not to say that debate doesn't continue. It does, it will, that's a good thing. But we need to be clear that this is a diverse group of scientific organizations and they are backed up by many, many, many others. Okay, now the good news. <laughs> You'll like this part a lot. Take climate change off the table. Okay, everything I just said, while I certainly think it's true, you don't have to buy it for anything else that I'm about to say. Because in fact, everything that we do to manage the risk of climate change is a good idea for at least three other reasons. What do we need to do to reduce our emissions? Anybody know offhand? We need to reduce the burning of fossil fuels. 
It's that simple. And that's actually the good news because our best tools for managing climate risk make excellent sense for lots of reasons. Fossil fuels have been tremendous resources. They've pulled millions out of poverty, they've made us mobile, they've helped us fly. And globally, we will almost certainly go on using them until they're gone. So to be clear, the argument I'm about to make is the argument for extension over time, not, subs not substitution overnight. So help me with a show of hands. Who thinks that fossil fuels will last forever? Okay, there's one. We got one. Um, it's, 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 it's probably not true. Um, but, but, you know, we'll see. Um, of course, fossil fuels are, are fossils, right? They were, they were buried millions of years ago. We know two key things about them with respect to the gentleman in the middle. They will run out, and the biggest supply of them is in faraway countries who tend to be hostile to us. So let's take the first case. They will run out. So if we are going to make, as I described it before, multi-billion dollar investments today, does it not make sense to maximize our investment in fuels that won't run out? It does. Secondly, others have more than we do. So as they run out, as the fossil fuels run out, we will face ever stiffer global competition for these extraordinary valuable resources. Already, China, with a population of ours plus a billion people, is buying up oil fields and energy companies across the globe. That was, in fact, the cover story of Fortune magazine last week when I was traveling. That means inevitably more expensive fuel. We will be competing even for our domestic coal resources. So to hedge against price spikes, and to head off global conflict, it makes sense to depend as much as possible on truly local energy sources. Add to these concerns the benefits of reducing, the health benefits of reducing our emissions. It simply means less mercury in our water, fewer particulates in our air, and clearly that means healthier families. And this is where we get to the good stuff. Because the great news is, Kansas is rich in fuels that are local, inexhaustible, and free. The energy is not free, but the fuel is free, and that's a very important benefit. We have the fuels of the future in abundance right here at home. Kansas, as many of you have heard, is the third windiest state in the nation. We have enough power blowing over our heads most days to light every home in America. Of course, the wind doesn't blow all the time. Uh, and, and it's important to note that New Yorkers may prefer to get energy from their own wind. In fact, they've said that they do. But here's what President Bush's Department of Energy had to say on the matter. Wind energy will provide 20% of US electricity needs by 2030, securing America's leadership in reliable, clean energy technology as an inexhaustible and affordable domestic resource, wind strengthens our security, improves the quality of air we breathe, slows climate change, and revitalizes rural communities. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Biomass, picture number two, prairie grasses. So beautiful, um, clearly not the only source of biomass, there are many, many others. Crop residues, dedicated energy crops, um, municipal and animal waste, uh, to, to name a few. And biomass is an enormously promising, barely tapped source of energy, both for electricity and for transportation fuels here in Kansas. Kansas already produces, as many of you I'm sure know, hundreds of millions of gallons of ethanol and biodiesel each year. And a recent report projected that we could repower nine of our coal plants with biomass and co-fire the rest at 10%. Solar energy, 
the beautiful sun at the very end. Uh, while currently as expensive as nuclear, is still in its relative infancy, and the good news there is that costs are expected to decline rapidly over the coming years. Kansas has a strong solar resource, and sun has the benefit of frequently being coincident with our heaviest use of, of electricity, typically for air conditioning in the summer months. So it's a very, very valuable resource. So the three fuels that every state wishes that they had, we have, and we have a lot of all three. Of course, all the renewable energy and transportation fuels in the world will do little to reduce dependence on fossil fuels unless we manage to actually use less. And here, too, the news is very good. Um, here you have a number of innovations that have begun our trip toward energy efficiency. And just to, to clearly define energy efficiency, because it sounds like one of those empty words that we don't really know what it means, energy efficiency simply means that we optimize, that we maximize the energy that we already generate. Because in fact, at least 50% of the energy that's generated at our power plants doesn't get to our plugs or our light fixtures. It's lost in various processes, it's lost in transmission, and we're not using it effectively. We can do vastly, vastly better than that, and much of the world already does. So there's a lot we can do behind the meter, so to speak, behind the systems that you and I interact with every day. But there's a great deal that we all can do too, and you all know um, about all of these things. There are CFLs, um, which already use dramatically less energy and create less heat than their predecessor, the incandescent bulb. But we're on, our way, we're on our way and have already begun to see LED lights, which are yet another advance beyond CFLs. Energy Star appliances, of course, use dramatically less energy while providing exactly the same productivity and services as their predecessors. Programmable thermostats are smart in a number of ways. One of the ways that utilities will be begin to use these programmable thermostats is to ask us if we would like to sign up for cheaper rates. Westar is actually rolling this out right now. If we would like to sign up for cheaper rates in return for being willing to have the utility remotely cycle our air conditioner in winter, or excuse me, in summer months at peak demand. Customers have prior notice of when this is likely to happen, and they can say no. So if you happen to have company that week, you can say no, not this time, I'm not gonna do it. But if you do, you have this wonderful low rate and you probably don't notice the difference because all that this program does is to cycle your air conditioner off for about 15 minutes over a several hour period. So most homes don't even have a temperature change. Believe it or not, something like that, rolling from home to home to home across the utility service area, can save a dramatic amount of energy and keep us from having to build new power plants, which are the thing, of course, that force all of our electric rates up. So there are numerous, myriad, almost endless ways to save energy that we've only just begun um, to work on. And one of the things that we know today is that consumers could save a good 200 billion B, billion dollars by 2030 simply by deploying technology that we have today. Okay, so what are the benefits of doing all of this? They're substantial and they are broad. The biggest reason probably to go toward renewable energy, and wind energy in particular, is its tremendous promise in terms of rural economic development. In fact, I would argue that there are, you know, we, we may never have seen the kind of prosperity that wind energy could bring to our state, particularly the western part of our state, where it's very windy, as many of you know. Um, we have, again, the third windiest state in the nation. What does that mean? That means, according to the Department of Energy, that Kansas could provide between seven and 10,000 megawatts of energy from wind by 2030. Now, we could do more, and the governor has been saying that he's, he's uh, determined that we'll do more. But even, even around 7,000 megawatts means $20 million each year to farmers and ranchers in Kansas, direct payments for hosting turbines on their land. It means another 19 million each year to our counties. And as you know, this means that, that rural schools can bloom again instead of disappearing. Counties can absolutely use this money, and, and I can tell you from having spoken to 
hundreds of county commissioners across the state that many, many counties are very eager to see this kind of development. In addition to that, we're looking at jobs, permanent jobs, about 1,800 of them, just in operations and maintenance alone. And if the nation chooses to go toward a renewable energy standard and get 20% of its energy from wind, or other renewables, but certainly wind included, then the Renewable Energy Policy Project actually projects 11,000 new manufacturing jobs in Kansas to supply that industry. And in fact, we're working with the Advanced Manufacturing Institute here at K-State and the Department of Commerce and the Blue-Green Alliance to survey about 1,000 Kansas companies to find out whether they can move into supplying this industry. So it's a tremendous opportunity um, in terms of revitalized manufacturing. And then, of course, we talked about hedges against global prices. In a world where fossil fuels will be the, uh, the topic not only of a lot of argument, but probably of a lot of global conflict, um, the more that we can avoid that, the better. That is the national security point, obviously. And then to the extent that we can depend on endless local fuels, clearly, clearly, we're better off in numerous ways. Our energy security is assured, but so is a sustainable economy. The other good news, we have in abundance the values to drive us to this future. And as someone who's spent a fair bit of time on both coasts, I can tell you that it's not always the case. I mean, the Midwest is really lucky in this regard because we do have a strong value of conservatism. We think that conserving things, options, money, is, is a good, is a good idea. Um, Overwhelmingly, Kansans attend church, and as we just talked about, most churches, I would say virtually every uh, church in the world actually has a stewardship commitment. Uh, Kansans have long been, you know, we're farmers, we're ranchers, we've long been committed to taking care of this place that we love. We also not only value, but still have community in the state of Kansas, and we're so lucky in that. We, um, the Climate and Energy Project is actually running a Take Charge Challenge right now with six Kansas communities across the state who are competing against one another to reduce their energy use. It's kind of the biggest loser except with energy um, in, in towns. <laughs> and this has been tremendously successful. We thought that, that the folks in these towns would sort of pat us on the head and say, that's just a lovely idea and you can hand out your light bulbs now. But in fact, they've been deeply engaged, very excited, Hundreds have shown up to the community celebrations. Volunteers are giving, you know, 10, 20, 30, 50 hours of their time um, to this project. So community really is um, an asset that we have in the Midwest that can help us get to this new future. And then, of course, we're fairly thrifty, um, which, again, is not true across the country. Most Kansans have told us over and over that we don't like to waste energy. It, it doesn't feel like the right thing to do. In fact, what people say to us over and over again is, well, of course I want to save energy. That's just the right thing to do. And, of course I want to use wind. That just makes sense. Finally, innovation. The Midwest in general, and Kansas in particular, has always innovated. We've always made do with what we have. It's a very proud tradition, certainly in my family. And if you saw our barns and other buildings, you would see that we're good at making do. But innovation is critical, and you all are the ones who are going to be providing that service. But first, this is Sir Edmund Burke. Edmund Burke is the founder of modern conservatism, and he wrote in The Nature of the State, a contract between generations, the following. Society is indeed a contract. Subordinate contracts for objects of mere occasional interest may be dissolved at pleasure, but the state ought not to be considered as nothing better than a partnership agreement in a trade of pepper and coffee, calico or tobacco, or some other such low concern, to be taken up for a little temporary interest and to be dissolved by the fancy of the parties. It is to be looked on with other reverence because it is not a partnership in things subservient only to the gross animal existence of a temporary or perishable nature. It is a partnership in all science, a partnership in all art, a partnership in every virtue and in all perfection. 
as the ends of such a partnership cannot be obtained in many generations, it becomes a partnership not only between those who are living and between those who are dead, but also with those who are yet to be born. This was written in 1790, as you may have guessed from the Calico uh, example. But basically, this comes down to the Boy Scout principle. This is really about leaving your campsite as good as you found it. And that's something that we are good at. So, the opportunity. I would encourage all of you in this room to view this climate and energy moment not as a threat and not as a sacrifice, but as a tremendous opportunity. You will hear that we do not have the technology to solve this problem, to leave our campsite as good as we found it. And that's true. We have the technology for the first 20 years. Energy efficiency and renewable energy, along with natural gas, will build a bridge to our future. That future will be crafted by you, by your ingenuity, by your innovation. This is the economy for your generation. We in the heartland are the Silicon Valley of the new energy economy. And like your ancestors, many of whom fought in the Revolutionary War, in the Civil War, in World War II, bravely, selflessly, I have every confidence that you will rise to this occasion, that you will do America proud, that you will rebuild a sustainable economy and secure an honorable place at the global table. Which brings us back to the founder of this lecture series. Dr. Douglas was well known, not just for the positions he took, but also for the generous spirit with which he reached out to those who disagreed with him. As we march forth together to tackle our challenge and embrace our opportunity, I'd like to invoke Dr. Douglas and remind us all to firmly reject false choices, to say no to the either or, and embrace instead the and both. As we do, let's strive to go gently, to resist judgment, to reach out, as he did, to unusual partners, and to remind the world that America's diversity, its tolerance, and our can-do, let's-go spirit are what make us great. Thank you for being with me tonight. So those who would like to exit can do so without hurting my feelings at all, maybe a little bit. And for those who want to stay, please come forward and feel free to ask as many questions as you'd like. Is it on? Oh, yeah. I have one question for you. 
it was about your biofuels and you were saying like how progressive it could be for us. I wanted to know on the statistic how much of that was corn based and how much of that was grass based. Because you projected it as being grasses, which we have plenty of it. But I mean, the ethanol being produced is, I mean, that's a huge concern for climate change in general. Yeah, absolutely right. So did everybody hear the question? The question is, can you hear me? Okay, so the question was uh, biofuels. How sustainable essentially are they? Um, what are the what is the climate profile of them? How much of the numbers that I gave are corn-based versus cellulose, correct? Okay. So the figures that I gave clearly are, are the industry of today, and the industry of today is heavy on corn. Uh, however, I think that anyone in the industry that you talk to uh, would tell you that there is a strong uh, and, and gradual move to alternative fuels. And so, for example, uh, the the head of the Abengoa project out at Hugoton that is going to be a big cellulosic ethanol plant um, recently addressed the Kansas Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency meeting and what he said at that meeting was that they are right now building their last corn ethanol plant. So there are many big, big players in the industry that are clearly moving to third generation fuels. But in the, in the transition, there are a number of plants here in Kansas already that are using unirrigated crops. That's one of the real issues um, in terms of, of thinking through bio, biofuels and their sustainability. So there are many people already who are using unirrigated milo, for example, as a feedstock. Um, and what we see is that this transition will be deliberate, um, as it should be, because farmers and ranchers were asked to invest in this on behalf of the United States of America. Um, so there will be supports to move them on to um, third generation biofuels, but we certainly see that happening in the in the next 15 years um, I was wondering about the the big wind turbines um, like the farmers are able to put them on their farms and are getting paid to put them on their farms is it just one turbine or is it multiple that depends entirely on the project and how much land uh, you've got and how amenable it is. Um, there are wind farms in Kansas where a single rancher owns 30 turbines, yeah. but that's rare. Um, there are many, many instances as well where a single landowner may have just one turbine or two or three. Uh, it, it depends entirely. And the, and the price range for those, it, sort of the leases for those turbines, run between about two and $5,000 per turbine per year. Uh, and many of those contracts, if not all of them have escalators um, in price over time. Uh, and also uh, on that point, I was wondering about uh, how, like, are there grants and things like that from the government for farmers to be able to install those? Like, if they want multiple ones, is there uh, like a grant or something like that from the government to be able to, you know, afford something like that? Because I'm pretty sure not a whole lot of farmers can just walk in out their pocket and throw yeah. that kind of money around. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And so a couple of distinctions to be made here. The big turbines, the big one megawatt or larger, the ones that you see from the highway when you drive out by Salina, for example, um, typically are going to be put up by a commercial developer. Um, and those are $2 million machines by and large, um, and that's why they're put up typically by, <laughs> by commercial developers. But the smaller machines um, are certainly I wouldn't say affordable, but getting more so. And yes, the answer is there are, there is government support. Um, right now it's a little tricky because the, the REAP project that is run through the uh, USDA, Rural Development Office, does provide grants and loans to farmers, ranchers, and small business people in the state of Kansas and elsewhere um, for renewable energy or energy efficiency improvements to their operations, but the trick there is that for most farmers and ranchers, what they'd like to have power for is their home, and that is an exclusion of the current program. So currently the program will allow you to put up a turbine that will power your farm, your ranch, those activities, your barn, but not your house. <laughs> so it's tricky, I expect it will change. Um, there are current current tax supports, um, rebates and so on for renewable energy investments. For most, for most of us, those don't pencil out yet, but again, this administration and this Department of Energy have certainly promised that they'll be trying to reform the tax code to make these, um, these resources able to play on a, on a level field. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, hey, Nancy. Hi, Hi. 
liked your talk quite a bit. It Thank definitely you. took uh, a different a different approach than we often hear. The uh, the standard polarized debate. Uh, I saw a great effort to try and get beyond that, and that's really I think vital. Um, you're speaking, of course, at Kansas land grant school, Indeed. charged with the mission of providing an affordable education to everyone in the state. Um, operating cooperative extension services throughout the state in every county. We have a presence in every county. Um, we're also a top research university, great research assets in a lot of different areas. Um, and we are basically a, a city as well in terms of our campus. Uh, I'm curious what you view the role of a land-grant school being in this future, this transformative future you're talking about and uh, what we can do right now to begin moving in that direction. Okay, that's an excellent question, and I'm sure you have all night. <laughs> so, um, so that is a perfect question. What is the role of a land-grant school in leading toward this future that arguably land-grant schools, land-grant students, um, are, are perfectly poised to take advantage of. And I've been sitting looking over at Ruth Douglas Miller um, over there, who of course runs the Wind Application Center here at K-State. So tremendous opportunities um, for engineers to get involved in all scales of, of wind development um, and, and eventually solar and all kinds of, of other um, of other opportunities. In addition, of course, um, Chuck Rice and uh, the whole team over at Extension and at the Kanza have been working for a long time on soil, on, on sequestration of carbon in soil, terrestrial sequestration, right? So, and that was something that I hadn't even mentioned, is that in addition to the other opportunities, um, as prices may rise as a result of putting a price on carbon, so will farmers and ranchers be able to make money by sequestering carbon in our soils. So again, a very rich vein of research and activity, I think, for K-State faculty and students. That's already happening, and surely it will continue into the future. Similarly, um, tremendous uh, investments here at K-State on research in both biofuels and biomass, and um, in fact, moving the nation on to ever more sustainable versions of both. Uh, but I think, too, you, you asked about extension, and that, that example is particularly compelling because, of course, agricultural extension, which does reach out into every county and to a lot of homes, has a history of working with families on energy efficiency, on helping them to use less, make do with less, uh, and that that history sort of took a break when we were extremely fat and happy. Not that you're fat, because you're not at all fat, but I'm just saying um, as a nation. And, um, and so I think that, that that, you know, returning to that, to those roots and to that history could be tremendously promising. And in fact, um, Bruce Need at Engineering Extension um, and a group of, of folks have been talking about that for some time, and I see a real promising role there. All of that said, though, Obviously, the real promise is in this room. The real promise is the students that are here at K-State um, now and in the future. And so the question becomes, how do we think about education as an opportunity to figure out different ways to be in the world? And in that regard, um, the Take Charge Challenge that I mentioned, uh, the, the sort of biggest loser contest, is something that we've toyed with taking to Big 12 universities. Because one thing that we've learned from this challenge is it works really well if communities already feel competitive with one another, if they happen to play each other in football or they're just down the road each from each other and they've competed for the county seat, you know, for 100 years. So um, if we were to, for example, get K-State and KU to compete against one another to holistically reduce energy use, um, I suspect that students and faculty at both schools would find tremendously innovative ways to get that done. And in fact, I would point to um, Dow Chemical did a neat thing several years ago. They basically offered a prize to their, to their employees and said, you figure out ways to save energy and we'll give you, we'll give you some money. And they expected they'd get a few applications and that maybe they'd run out of ideas after a year or maybe two. Not at all, it's still going. And they have saved millions and millions and millions of dollars 
well over and above what they paid to their employees. And it's just become fun. It's become a challenge. And this is what we find with energy all the time. Weirdly enough, people get interested and excited about it. So I think the opportunities are virtually endless. But one thing that I would love you all to think about is how to engage as a campus in really talking about these issues and actually living them out. OK, I have to follow up then. Um, so how many people would want to compete against KU to try and save more energy? Sweet. Well, that's pretty good. Okay, so back to you. Um, when are you going to send a message to President Schultz inviting him to take part in, the take in, the, in this challenge? Well, you know, we'll send him a note tomorrow, Ben. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Let me know. I'm not one to let an opportunity go by. All right. Thanks. Did I see another question down here? No? I kind of have a couple questions. Okay. My first question is just going to be, um, I'm just curious what other avenues you go to to speak at. Because Jay mentioned churches, and we had a conversation, and we thought that was a good idea, but we were just curious, like, where else you might, where else you spoke at, like, the time you were active with this uh, organization you're a part of? Um, so where, where else have I given talks? I don't I mean, I go to a lot of Rotaries and a lot of Lions Clubs. Um, and of course, one of the programs that we coordinate is Interfaith Power and Light. And um, Eileen Horn, who coordinates that program, isn't here right now, but she does a brilliant job and speaks to many, many churches across Kansas. And what that program does, if anybody has a hometown church that might be interested in this, what the program does is that it helps the church to get an energy audit for their sanctuary and then to pursue those uh, efficiency improvements. And then frequently, um, those churches end up getting excited about becoming cool congregations. And cool congregations actually reach out to their congregants and help teach them how to save money and energy in their homes and businesses. So that's, um, that's a wonderful program. I'm trying to think where else, I mean, um, I've, t I've spoken to a lot of chambers of commerce. I've spoken to Leadership Kansas. Um, and I just don't know. I don't okay, know. So then that leads me to my next question. And that's, uh, my first question is, is going to be based on um, naysayers mm -hmm. to kind of your, because what you are saying, there are a lot of naysayers. Mm -hmm. So my question is, what are the main things that you notice naysayers tend to disagree with? And how do you handle that? And what's your response to them? Mm -hmm. And then my next question after that is, I'll let you answer that and then I'll, I'll ask my next okay. question. It's off top. <laughs> All right, so um, I'm going to rephrase slightly and just say, you know, there, there are a lot of Kansans and, and our, our polling and focus group work um, and just our outreach. I should have said, we also have, we've held energy forums all around the state, so that's another place that I've certainly talked. But what we found is that, is that at least half of Kansans, and it may be more, um, just, they're just not buying climate change right now, right? And so um, I tend to think of it less as, as naysaying and more as just, hey, I'm not, I'm not persuaded yet, and I may never be. Um, where I tend to go with that is, is uh, my experience has been that I'm probably not gonna talk folks into a belief that they don't already have. I mean, I, I don't know, did I convert any of y'all tonight? I, I doubt it. Um, but, but, what I, but what I do think is important is really focusing on that notion of, hey, even if you don't, even if you don't buy climate change, um, and a lot of people don't, everything we do to address it is a good idea to do for multiple other reasons. So, so let's just talk about, I mean, and here's the, here's the issue, I think. Um, this is a long-running argument in my, in my family, actually. Um, what's more important, purity of motive or constancy in action. You know, I'm gonna go with constancy in action. I don't mind why you do it, I just want you to do it because it's the right thing to do and almost everybody knows that. So the last thing I'll share with you on that point is we did hold a number of focus groups and we talked only with uh, independents and Republicans because Democrats, you know, there weren't enough. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm totally kidding. I'm just totally kidding right now. Um, but, we, but we did only talk to, to independents and Republicans. And, and we did it in several places in the state. And it was facilitated by you know, a professional, and as it happens, a Republican strategist um, who came in to, to do this for us. He's from Iowa. He facilitates extremely neutrally. So he was not leading them in any way, shape, or form, because we wanted to know what people thought. And here was what was interesting, is that we had, we had these groups. In every single case, the same thing happened and it was he would say what about climate change is it happening and they would say no 
Absolutely not. And then somebody in the group would say, well, I don't know, I, you know, I've noticed I'm planning things at a different time, and I don't know, I think the seasons are a little different than they used to be. And then the whole group would sort of move to, okay, well, something's probably happening, but we didn't do it. This isn't, this isn't, it's not human cause, this isn't about us. And then somebody in the group would say, yeah, but you know, those coal plants, and you can see the stuff, and the cars, and we're probably, we probably have something to do with it. I mean, we're, we're, we put stuff out there, we probably have some role, even if it's natural systems too. And then they would say, but I don't think that we can do anything about it. We can't, we can't rein it in. And then somebody would say, in every single group, somebody would say, well, I don't know, there's a lot that we could, I mean, there's stuff that's just right to do. I mean, we could do this stuff. I mean, I kind of do this stuff. And then they would go around and say all the things that they already do. And then the guy who was running these would say to one of them, who usually was the one who said climate change is absolutely not happening, almost every time that person was doing more than any other person in the group <laughs> to save energy. It was, it was amazing. And so he would say to him, well, why are you doing all this? And he said, well, look, I just do it because it's the right thing, but I'll tell you what, I'm not going to do it to make Al Gore a bunch of money, <laughs> which was awesome. It happened in every group. Somebody said something about Al Gore. But my point is simply, <laughs> I do have a point. Um, my point is simply that I think that this issue has become really unfortunately and almost inexcusably politically polarized. Right? And so it's become an identity issue where if you're like me, you want to do what I do, and if you're not like me, you say she's an idiot. Um, and that is unfortunate because this is not an issue that really lends itself to political stuff. So um, what we tend to try to do is be extremely respectful of people's genuinely held opinions and to, and to let them all come out and to ask a bunch of questions. And in our experience, most of the time, it kind of goes like that. And people end up saying, okay, well, I don't totally buy your, your thing here about climate change, but you know what? You're right. I'm going to do all this stuff because I, I think it's a good idea to do anyway. So for what it's worth. My final question, you kind of touched up on that. I just was curious because we will have a governor's race and um, I don't think our Democratic, the governor that we have in office right now, he's not going to be rerunning from what I understand. And you had said that he, he had made a commitment, but to me, as someone who's younger, I kind of see that as like, well, like I made a commitment, but he's going to be out of office in less than a year, so who really cares what he has to say? So I'm curious what your opinion is on uh, Sam Brownback and um, if, if your organization, if they've worked with him on policy, if they've given reports and kind of... Uh, just your overall opinion on how this governor's race, what, what, do, you, what do you think will happen? <laughs> what do y'all think will happen? I, I think we probably know what will happen. But yes, the answer is we, we have. We have worked um, quite a bit with Senator Brownback over the last um, year plus um, in particular because this issue has been much more um, at play at the federal level. And I can tell you that Senator Brownback is absolutely a champion for transmission. Um, in fact, I was just at a transmission summit all day today. Um, this, I will tell you, even me, was better than what um, we saw. And Senator Brownback had a, a film that he actually sent to the transmission summit saying, this is absolutely one of my top priorities. This is what I want to do. I want to make wind happen in Kansas. So he's very, you know, he voted for the renewable energy standard um, out, of, out of committee. That was a critical vote. If Senator Brownback hadn't voted in that way, it would have been a little bit more dicey in terms of passing. Um, Senator Brownback has also been a champion for a long time um, on the sequestration sequestration of carbon in soils and what farmers and ranchers can do in that regard. So, um, you know, the senator has clear creation care commitment personally. Um, I certainly don't see him supporting a cap and trade kind of, of, of legislation, but he definitely supports wind and he supports transmission and he supports uh, farmers and ranchers and how they can position themselves to thrive in a new, in a new economy. So, you know, I think overall on energy issues, Senator Brownback's pretty good. Uh, 
I visited the Land Institute probably 30 years ago, and I was intrigued at the idea of the perennial gr uh, grain crops. Could you update us on progress or if there's still hope for that development? Yeah, yeah, I'd love to do that. So for those of you who don't know the Land Institute, the Land Institute has been working for decades on the perennialization of the world's great grain crops. And as many of you already know, about 70% of our calories globally come from grains. So to the extent that we can help our agriculture mimic natural systems, right? And, and of course, here we have a prairie. And what is a prairie? It's perennials, deep, deep-rooted grasses that are planted in combination. So the notion is to do the same with agriculture. And the good news is um, that there's actually been tremendous uh, progress on the perennialization of wheat. Uh, we have an intermediate wheat grass right now that's kind of a cross and from which we have flour that is not just edible, but fairly palatable. Um, you, you would like the muffins and the cakes, and if you go to the Land Institute, they'll make you eat some. So, um, but, but so the, 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 the results are promising. The, probably the biggest thing that we found in that research, the, the most promising piece is, there's a bit of traditional wisdom that says that you have to give up yields um, in order to get the perennialization. That's just been accepted forever. And the Land Institute scientists believe that they've cracked that nut and that that is not, it, again, the either or. It doesn't have to be an either or. We might be able to do a both and. Um, now, is this gonna be um, on the market in the fields uh, in the next couple of years? No. Uh, this is gonna take some time to roll out. We've, we are the furthest with wheat. We have international partnerships uh, where we're working with folks internationally on rice and on corn um, in particular. So. Between those three, uh, that's that's a lot of a lot of the world's food. So we hope to get there, but it's not going to be super soon. But the but the but the research is extremely promising. It's going well. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, you mentioned wind energy, and there's a lot of emphasis, a lot of energy within Kansas, with respect to wind energy. How do you think we can ultimately store wind energy? How do you see that? Uh, my understanding that's one of the big negatives is storing wind energy. Okay, how do you cope with that? Yeah, so good question. The question is, how do you store wind energy? And of course, the basis of that question is that wind, as I mentioned earlier, and as we all know, doesn't blow all the time. So that variability um, is the issue. Because of course, the, the easiest electric or the easiest uh, generation for utilities to make use of is what we typically refer to as base load. And all base load means is that it's dispatchable, um, and that means that you can, you can deliver it on demand. And obviously you can't make the wind blow when it's not blowing. So that leads to the, the storage question. What the Department of Energy has said is that all the way up to about 20% wind, so if we were to get a fifth of our total energy, our electricity energy in the United States from wind, that we could do simply with a, a better transmission grid. So it would balance itself uh, across the country and in essence, be stored on the wires. There's really no st storing energy. I mean, of course, you all know that. But um, energy itself cannot be stored. Those electrons just go where they're going, and you can't do anything about it. Um, but to your point, to get beyond 20% at this point, many, uh, many of, the, of the engineers feel like storage is the answer. The good news is there are a number of possibilities um, on that front. There are some things that are being done already, like the moving of water uphill when you've got excess wind and you don't need it for load, and then you let the water come back downhill and it turns a turbine. Similarly, uh, compressed air energy storage. We have here in Kansas a lot of geologic formations that lend themselves to this. And the notion there is very simple. You just basically dig a really deep hole, you compress a bunch of air into it when the wind is blowing and you can't use it in your electric system. And then when you need it back again, you use a little gas um, turbine, combustion turbine, to just get it started. And then as the air comes back out, it turns a turbine and you've, you've essentially stored uh, your energy. But one of the things that is probably the most promising from a utility perspective, as our grid gets smarter, as we rebuild our transmission system, and to the extent that we make it smart, and you all will hear about smart grid, and I'm just gonna tell you right now, nobody really knows what that is. We're finding out right now. But it is, if you think about it, just basically the marriage of the electric system and the telecommunication system. So it's basically a grid that communicates with itself and across all kinds of boundaries. And so can use much more effectively distributed generation. Winds that's blowing over here and over there, it can, it can tamp down load, it can control demand um, as, as necessary. 
in that system, when we have a smarter grid, um, I'm sure that many of you already know that the Department of Energy um, is fully expecting, and we're about to see, well, we are seeing, um, for those who can afford them, on the streets now, hybrid electric vehicles. And this, again, I, I should have spoken about earlier, but this ties into that national security issue. Because to the extent, you know, a lot of people say to me, oh, come on, you can't get off foreign oil by, you know, wind energy for electricity. That's stupid. This is how you can. If you're driving on wind, then you need less oil. And the beauty of it is, here in the state of Kansas, our wind tends to blow disproportionately at night. And that's when we would mostly be charging our cars. So to the extent that we can plug our cars in overnight, charge them up to drive, and then, with a smart grid, go to docking stations, uh, stations at our offices, at our schools, and actually have the opportunity for our utilities to pull back off those cars in specified amounts to meet our peak demand. Um, this is a tremendously exciting idea um, from, from the perspective of storage and the maximization of that resource. Does that answer your question? Yes, pretty much so. Okay. Uh, may I ask a second question? You mentioned cap and trade. Mm -hmm. How do you come down on carbon tax, and how will we incorporate that within Kansas and within the U.S.? Okay, so um, there are any number of ways that, that uh, carbon can get a price, which is kind of what we're talking about here. This can happen through legislation, it can happen through regulation, and it can happen through international treaty. Those are the three most obvious. On the legislation side, there are kind of, and, and by the way, EPA has already filed um, a very extensive way of dealing with carbon. So it's that, it looks like, or something else. And right now the proposal before Congress is cap and trade, uh, but the other way to go is a carbon tax. And a carbon tax, of course, just simply assigns a, a price per ton of carbon, and we all pay it. Um, from, from our perspective at the Climate and Energy Project, uh, we, we're, we're not a huge fan of the tax. I love the simplicity of, of a tax, um, if you're going to do this. But the, we're, as it turns out, and we see this all over the globe, we're enormously willing to pay a ton to be able to drive, fly, and, and, and burn stuff, because it's great. And so the, the, the risk that we take if we do this through a tax is that we pay a, an enormous amount, an enormous amount, and we don't get a guaranteed environmental result. And it seems to me, if you're gonna do this, you should really do it in a way that actually works. And so from that perspective, a cap is the thing that makes the most sense. And Cap and trade can be complicated, which the current bills are, or it can be really simple. And many people don't know, we actually have a cap and trade in the United States today for sulfur dioxide. It's called the Acid Rain Program, and it's worked beautifully. It's dealt with the issue, it got there ahead of time and under budget, um, and it did so by sending a market signal. And the way that I like to explain cap and trade is that this is really nothing more than a simple, elegant market signal. It says to companies, you will make money if you find ways to reduce emissions. And for everybody else, you can still pollute, but you just have to pay a fee, just like you would at the dump, right? Now, in the cap and trade that's proposed, there are all kinds of other options, some of them quite good for Kansas farmers, including offsets. So the notion is that companies get flexibility in how they can reduce these emissions. They can do it in all kinds of different ways, and one of them is they can basically buy credits from farmers, and as Chuck Rice here at K-State would say, the, the atmosphere doesn't care how you do it. The atmosphere just cares that you do it. So if I'm an emitter, I may pay you to sequester a ton of carbon in your soils if your price is less than the allowance price, right? So where do we come down? Um, I personally think it's going to be much cheaper, much more effective, and much better for our economy to send a clear market signal than to go with either a tax or an international treaty that would be negotiated by diplomats who may or may not know a ton about energy. So, um, that, so that's, that's, that's where I stand. As you've stated, there are whole countries that thrive on energy, and energy plants have hundreds of thousands of employees, and there's a lot of money to be had in energy. But if whole campuses like Concordia University of Austin, Texas, 
were to go completely green, whole organizations were to go completely green, self-sufficient, and having their own wind turbines and solar panels, how much money and jobs are we losing? Okay, so that's a good question. So the question is, um, do you actually harm the economy, right, by, by essentially replacing? So if you become self-sufficient and go, in some sense, off the grid, are you taking away those jobs, right? Um, no, you're not, and here's why. Uh, because our country and every country is growing. You know, we've, we've got about six billion people on the planet, now we're headed to 10. Um, rapidly. And so the, the, the challenge that we have before us is how do we keep our emissions steady or declining and supply energy for all those new demands? How do we have a big, productive, wonderful economy um, and, and, and not pollute ourselves out of the place? <laughs> and so efforts like that um, and for example, Architecture 2030 is a wonderful organization that is committed to zero energy buildings by 2030. And what they're talking about is all new buildings should produce as much electricity as they consume, which is possible. There are lots of them uh, around the world now. Um, that's an exciting prospect because what it allows you to do is to flatten right now, electric use has been on a curve like this for a long, long time. If through these kinds of efforts you can dampen that curve and bring it close to even, then as these old plants that I mentioned retire, you have the opportunity to replace those plants with renewable energy, which gets you your emissions goals uh, and keeps your economy healthy. It's also true, um, according to the Department of Energy, that there are actually multiples of jobs in renewable energy versus traditional fossil fuels, partly because we've just gotten so good at using them. You know, we're so good at burning coal and, and good at refining oil that we don't have to employ that many people to do it anymore, whereas we're learning how to do the, the renewable energy piece. And by definition, it's distributed. It's all over the place, so you've got to have a lot of people to do it. I'm going to jump in here because my question is really related to what you just said about distributed energy. Um, and so we've got the big turbines, which are these really large companies, some of the largest utilities in the world, investing in these really large industrial scale plants, right? And they're paying farmers lease payments, and that's you know how it's working. Um, but the model that you talked about earlier and that you just kind of hinted at, this distributed model where you've got lots of smaller turbines, maybe owned ones right. and twos by farmers here, here and there, um, that's a totally different model. Right. Now, if we invest 20 gigawatts in Kansas by 2030 or 10 gigawatts or whatever it is in the big industrial model, do we put ourselves at hazard toward that smart grid future with lots of smaller turbines? You're doing an either or, Ben. Yeah, well. Have I'm I achieved nothing tonight? Devil's advocacy, Nancy. Um, if, if the National uh, Technical Director for Wind Powering America were here, what he would say is, we're going to need it all. We're, I mean, we're absolutely going to need both. Um, the, the, the big energy, you know, from greenhouse gas reduction perspective, uh, in terms of how do we reduce those emissions quickly and keep our economy healthy, those big turbines are critical. You gotta have utility scale wind to get it done. That said, there are lots of other really cool models that are being explored right now. For example, rural electric cooperatives own small lines. They own small distribution lines. They tend to be located in relatively windy places without big urban centers. So one of the models that's being toyed with, they also have a very cheap cost of capital because the, the cooperative corporation um, can, can loan money at very inexpensive rates. So the notion is that cooperatives could actually become sort of feeders um, of, of the grid and that farmers could in fact put up these smaller turbines, distribute it along these smaller lines, and that co-ops could actually make money supplying a renewable resource to say Walmart, um, who has said very clearly that it wants exactly that kind of energy in exactly these kinds of places. There are many other models. There are lots of farmers and ranchers who've gotten together in limited liability corporations all over the country, either putting up their own capital or actually raising venture capital to go ahead and invest in various sized turbines. Uh, and the, and the crucial answer there is, do they have a buyer for that electricity? Um, and so the renewable energy standard at a national level uh, is, is probably going to be critical to actually making those, uh, those dreams come true. But my answer would be, we, there's room for both, and I don't think that they're mutually exclusive in any way. All right, I think, oh, one more. 
Hi. Hi. I teach Latin American history here, and so I'd like to go a little bit back to something you said earlier, and I apologize if it was just a fleeting statement, but I was really intrigued by the uh, references in your talk uh, to security, security yeah. in the environment, and I teach a class on security studies in Latin America, and in particular, you mentioned that the CIA has created a department of climate change and security, which I find enormously fascinating. So do I. And I'm wondering if you could maybe speak a little bit more to that. Um, it seems like it's kind of a vogue move for the CIA to do this. Like, well, everybody's concerned about climate change, and so we'll create a task force. And um, I'm wondering if maybe, because we have a graduate program in security studies here, if maybe you could speak a little bit to yeah. the bigger picture and where you see these areas sort of merging. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, the security issue, and I, and I wish I could speak directly to the CIA program, which I knew virtually nothing about, because, you know, it's the CIA, and you're not going to know. Um, and, and plus, it's really new. Um, but, but I think that that did come actually from a genuine concern on the part of the United States military. Um, they, they are all over the world, and they're already experiencing some of these issues um, around the globe. And one of the things they know, and that I didn't make a part of this talk, but um, you'll hear me say it some other time, I'm sure. What does T. Boone Pickens know that we don't? He knows that water is the new oil. That's what he knows. He's been buying up water rights all over Texas because he knows they are going to be more valuable than his fossil fuels. Um, he doesn't exactly know when, and frankly, I don't think he's going to live to see it, but, you know, somebody um, in his family will. And so water is going to be one of the, and fossil fuels, um, are, are going to be really key. But also, if, if, the, if the models are right, and if the kind of global displacement and famine and, I mean, right, lots of extreme weather events, which put the military at great risk because they're already stretched and yet they have to respond to, to relief efforts that are widely dispersed. There's just a wide recognition on the part, not just of our military, but the entire United Nations, that this, is, that this has got to be dealt with. And so while it may be vogue, in some places I would say not so much here, but it may be vogue to deal with this issue, um, I, I do think that there's actually a genuine underpinning and that it comes from the operational people, from the people in the field who say, we got to deal with this because if we don't, it's going to be really hard later. All right. Yeah? If I may, uh, you've talked briefly about the fossil fuel issues and the, re the emissions that are generated from that. Can you, has your institution uh, made a stand upon fuel treatments and the reduction of emissions, especially if they're registered with EPA and things of that nature, please? Um, if, I under, if I understand the question, I'm not totally sure, so you may have to clarify or re-ask, um, but, but what I can tell you is that I am actually sitting right now on the Midwestern Governors Association Low Carbon Fuel Standard Advisory Group, yet another one of these stupid long names. And so yes, um, you know, the, the question clearly is, and, and, and transportation fuels are, are a tough one, because just so that everybody knows, because a lot of people feel like um, a cap and trade or a carbon tax or whatever the case might be would absolutely destroy our, our transportation infrastructure. Here's how that works. For every dollar per ton of carbon cost, that equates to about a penny per gallon of gasoline. Okay, so at a $20 carbon price, which is not projected until probably 2030-ish, uh, we'd be talking about a $2 increase in our gas price, which wouldn't be fun, but then again, we were there, you know, just really recently. So, so that said, I don't think that that kind, of a, that kind of a tax would have to be enormously high to actually get people to drive remarkably less. So what is the answer? The answer is either reduce your vehicle miles traveled, which in the state of Kansas, you know, we're a rural state, really, what are we going to do? Uh, we're probably going to keep driving. Uh, and so then the only other option is to decarbonize your fuels. Um, and in fact, that's, again, a place where innovation is going to be necessary and land grant schools like K-State are going to have a huge role to play. Um, and there are tremendous arguments about this 
in every conceivable way. The water that we use to irrigate, irrigate the potential crops, um, the water that we use in the processing of those crops for fuels. Um, the most controversial thing is the notion of, of displacement, um, you know, of indirect land use is what it's called. So the notion that if you were to grow crops for fuels rather than food, that the acreage for the food will just go someplace else but still be taken out of grass or forest or whatever it used to be. So lots to be figured out here, but yes, we are part of a very huge group um, nationally who are working very hard to try to find solutions, and I expect some of them will come from this room eventually. I appreciate your environmental history background, and also appreciate uh, your appeal to some deep-rooted uh, Kansas values, uh, which makes me ask this question. Uh, how would you uh, respond to the contention that Kansas is, in fact, one of the only regions in the country that has already experienced anthropogenic climate change in the form of the Dust Bowl? And if so, what lessons did we learn there that we've lost in our short-term memory? Well, you just so asked the right person this question. Um, as it happens, my graduate supervisor was Donald Worcester, and his first book was about a book called Dust Bowl, and it won the big history prize, the Bancroft Prize. Um, his, his analysis in that book is controversial, but I'll lay it on you anyway. Um, Don Worcester feels that, uh, that research shows clearly that the Dust Bowl, while certainly an ecological event. I mean, certainly the drought was the drought, and there's no getting around that. Nevertheless, his contention is that the drought was much, much harder on people than it need have been because our farming practices at that time, having gotten established in a very wet period, were utterly unadapted for that shift so that it, it uh, laid bare, essentially, uh, the, the Great Plains for the kind of devastation that, in fact, uh, we, we experienced. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a great example of, of a situation in which the natural cycle is there, <laughs> undeniably, uh, and yet there is an, a human component of it as well. And I think that's really the question here is, are we called to do at least what we can? Right? Um, and, it, and it's sort of that precautionary principle. Do we, you know, we, we're, we're running an, unex, an, an, an uncontrolled experiment uh, on the only planet that we have, right? And so is that, is that a risk worth running or do we wanna manage that risk? And I would argue clearly that we wanna do every darn thing we can to manage that risk short of hurting people, right? Um, so I, I think that the Dust Bowl experience is actually very instructive in that regard. Does that answer your question? Okay. All right, I think you're done. You're such a brave and fabulous audience. Thank you, everybody.